So this is my second video on hemostasis. I'm going to mostly talk about coagulation cascade, but if you want to learn what happens before the coagulation cascade in hemostasis, then watch my first video by clicking right up here. Let's move on to coagulation cascade. So a coagulation cascade is a series of amplifying enzymatic reactions leading to the deposition of an insoluble fibrin clot. So, so far we know about our platelet plug, but we also need fibrin strands to be added to it in order to consolidate it. Now, fibrin is not found directly in blood, but instead it's found in the form of fibrinogen. The goal of the coagulation cascade is to convert fibrinogen into fibrin so that fibrin can make up strands and attach to the platelet plug. Components involving in coagulation cascade are assembled on a negatively charged phospholipid surface provided by activated platelets and the enzymes are passed from one partner to the next the enzymes in this cascade are the coagulation factors and they are all referred to with a number. So in each step we have a proenzyme. Proenzyme means the inactive form of an enzyme, the precursor of an enzyme that has to somehow be converted to the active form of that enzyme. But how is the proenzyme converted into the active form of that enzyme? This requires an activator enzyme and sometimes a cofactor or an accelerator to help it. So usually in this cascade, the activator of each reaction is the product of the previous reaction. So let's take a look at it one by one. At first, we have a coagulation factor 12, which is converted into its active form 12A, A standing for activated. This reaction is activated by the negatively charged surface provided by the platelets, or in other words, contact with the negatively charged surface is required for this reaction. Then we have coagulation factor 11 being converted into its active form 11A. This reaction is activated by the product of the previous reaction, which would be coagulation factor 12A. Then we have coagulation factor 9 being converted into its active form, which is 9A. This reaction is of course activated by the product of the previous reaction, which was coagulation factor 11A. In the next step, coagulation factor 10 has to be converted into its active form 10A. This reaction is of course activated by the product of the previous reaction, coagulation factor 9A. Except 9A cannot do this on its own and needs the help of 8A, a cofactor. Now, the next step is important. In the next step, prothrombin, which is the inactive precursor form of thrombin, is converted into its active form, thrombin. This happens by cleaving a part of prothrombin off. Prothrombin is also called factor 2, which would make thrombin factor 2A. This reaction is activated, of course, by the product of the previous reaction, which was 10A. Except once again, 10A cannot do this by its own, and it requires the help of 5A, a cofactor. The next step is the last one, which leads to the production of what we needed from the beginning, fibrin. So as we said, fibrin is in the form of its precursor, fibrinogen. Also fibrinogen has to have a part of it cleaved in order to become active fibrin. This reaction is activated by thrombin, aka coagulation factor 2A. Let's also mention that fibrinogen is also called coagulation factor 1, which would make fibrin coagulation factor 1A. So that's it, not too difficult. You just have to remember the right numbers. They are like counting from 12 to 10, except for swapping 9 and 10.
We should also remember how 9 goes together with 8 as its cofactor. Is it remember they are just next to each other? And 10 goes together with 5, also easy to remember, 5 is half of 10. So, so far, this was the intrinsic pathway, but we also have an extrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway starts with the conversion of coagulation factor 3 into its active form 3A. Coagulation factor 3 is also called tissue factor. Now, we already mentioned that tissue factor is present in the subendothelium and is only expressed when the endothelium is injured. So, you can see its external origin, hence extrinsic pathway. The conversion of tissue factor to its active form is activated by coagulation factor 7. We are already arriving at the step of converting coagulation factor 10 to its active form. But activated tissue factor cannot do it by its own. So it needs the help of activated coagulation factor 7 or 7A, a cofactor. The rest of it is identical to the intrinsic pathway. The coagulation factor 10 is converted to its active form 10A. 10A with the help of 5A activates the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin and thrombin activates the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. What we reviewed together is in fact what happens in vitro or in the lab. In real life or in vivo, the major coagulation factor is the tissue factor or coagulation factor 3, which works via the extrinsic factor. But once it produces some thrombin, thrombin itself amplifies some reactions of both extrinsic and intrinsic pathways, creating a feedback loop. Thrombin works on coagulation factors 5, 8, 9, and 11. Calcium also has a role in these reactions. It binds to gamma carboxylated glutamic acid residues on some coagulation factors, helping their activation. Vitamin K is a cofactor in these reactions, meaning it helps them. Some drugs, such as Coumadin, antagonize vitamin K, limiting the reactions. Therefore, these drugs are used as anticoagulants. At this point, let's take a look at a couple of clinical tests that help us assess coagulation in patients. We have the prothrombin time, or PTSA, and we have the partial prothrombin time, or PTTSA. So in prothrombin time, or PTSA, we want to assess the function of the proteins involved in the extrinsic pathway only. So these proteins would be protein 7, 10, 5, and 2, or prothrombin, and 1, or fibrinogen. So tissue factor 3, phospholipids, and calcium are added to the patient's plasma, and the time for a fibrin clot to form is recorded. In the next assay, the partial thromboplastin time, or PTTSA, we assess the function of the proteins involved in the intrinsic pathway, meaning factor 12, 11, 9, 8, 10, 5, and 2, or prothrombin, and fibrinogen, or 1. We add negatively charged particles that activate factor 12, plus phospholipids and calcium, and the time to fibrin clot formation is recorded. Now, these assays have their uses, of course, but usually the key knowledge in bleeding disorders is to find out which coagulation factor specifically is missing, or we are dealing with the deficiency of which coagulation factor. While a deficiency of most of these coagulation factors would cause a mild bleeding disorder, a deficiency of prothrombin, or factor 2, is incompatible with life. An interesting fact is that a factor 12 deficiency is associated with susceptibility to thrombosis, meaning clot formation rather than bleeding. This paradoxical effect of factor 12 may be explained by its role in fibrinolysis pathway, 
Okay, so that's pretty much it with the coagulation factor, but let's take a look at a couple of more nodes. So, so far we know that thrombin is quite important. We have already mentioned most of its roles, but let's take an exclusive look at thrombin's role. We can mostly point out the following four. Firstly, conversion of fibrinogen into cross-linked fibrin. Another one would be platelet activation. The third one is pro-inflammatory effects, and the fourth one is anticoagulant effects. So as for the conversion of fibrin into cross-linked fibrin, thrombin has the most important role in the cascade, which is the final conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin monomers. Fibrin can then polymerize into an insoluble clot. As we mentioned earlier, thrombin also amplifies several factors of the coagulation cascade. Once again, namely factor 5, 8, 9, 11, and 13. So in order to remember that, just count 5 odd numbers from number 5 and then substitute number 7 with 8. So this brings us to factor 13. We haven't talked about factor 13 yet. Uh, what factor 13 does is that it covalently cross-links fibrin strands helping stabilize the clot. So also factor 13 is activated by thrombin. The next one is platelet activation. So as mentioned earlier, thrombin is a potent activator of platelets. It also promotes their aggregation by its ability to activate PARs or protease activated receptors on platelets. This function of thrombin links platelet function to coagulation. The next one was pro-inflammatory effects of thrombin. So PARs or protease activated receptors on platelets are also expressed on inflammatory cells, endothelium and also other cells. So activation of these receptors by thrombin on these cells has a pro-inflammatory effect which contributes to tissue repair and angiogenesis. The last one was anticoagulant effect, so this one is pretty interesting. So once thrombin reaches a part in the endothelium that is intact and not injured, it changes from a procoagulant to an anticoagulant. So this function prevents the extension of clot formation beyond the site of injury. So this is how coagulation happens and the clot is formed. But as you can imagine, this clot formation has to be limited to a certain necessary degree. So what are the factors that limit coagulation? So firstly, blood flow that causes a dilution and essentially washes all these factors away from the site of coagulation. The next one to mention would be the fact that the platelets are no more activated after a certain point to provide us with negatively charged phospholipids necessary for the cascade. The next thing to mention would be the factors that are expressed by the intact endothelium adjacent to the site of the injury that actively downregulate the coagulation. The last one is the fibrinolytic cascade. The fibrinolytic cascade is done mostly by the action of plasmin, which breaks down fibrin and interferes with its polymerization. Plasmin is generated from its precursor, which circulates the blood. One of the pathways converting plasminogen to plasmin involves the coagulation factor 12. The most important plasminogen activator, although, is TPA, which is produced by the endothelium and is most active while bound to fibrin. Plasmin itself is regulated by factors such as alpha-2 plasmin inhibitor, a factor that binds and inhibits free plasmin. Now, lastly, we have to talk about the endothelium. Endothelium can have both anticoagulant and procoagulant activities. Sometimes a balance between the two determines the direction of clot formation, propagation or dissolution. Let's review how. The function of endothelium in hemostasis can be divided mostly under the following three categories. Firstly, platelet inhibitory effects then anti 
anticoagulant effects and then fibrinolytic effects. So let's start with platelet inhibitory effects. So normal intact endothelium acts as a barrier between platelets that are in the lumen and components of the subendothelium, which include von Willebrand factor and collagen, therefore limiting platelet activation. But they also actively release substances that inhibit platelet activation. These sub substances include prostacycline or PGI2, nitric oxide or NO, adenosine diphosphatase, which degrades ADP, which is a potent activator of platelets. They also bind and alter the activity of thrombin, another potent activator of platelets. The next one was anticoagulant effects. So another factor that is shielded beneath the endothelium is tissue factor, which is necessary for the coagulation cascade. Besides that, endothelium also actively produces factors that inhibit coagulation cascade. For example, thrombomodulin, endothelial protein C receptor, heparin-like molecules, and tissue factor pathway inhibitor, or TFPI. Thrombomodulin, what does it do? So it binds thrombin. While bound to thrombin, thrombin loses its ability to activate platelets and coagulation factors, and it instead, it activates protein C. Protein C is a vitamin K-dependent protease that requires a cofactor, protein S. Protein C, together with protein S, form a complex that inhibits coagulation factors 5A and 8A. The next one is endothelial protein C receptor, which binds protein C. So again, protein C together with protein S can form a complex that inhibits coagulation factors. The next one was heparin-like molecules. Heparin-like molecules bind and activate antithrombin-3, which then inhibits thrombin and factors 9A, 10, 11A, and 12A. Tissue factor pathway inhibitor, or TFPI, is also like protein C. It requires protein S as a cofactor. It binds and inhibits the tissue factor factor 7A complexes. The next one is fibrinolytic effects of the endothelium. So as mentioned before, normal endothelium produces TPA, which is a key component of fibrinolysis. This limits the clot formation to the site of the injury and doesn't allow it to go further to the intact endothelium. Thank you very much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you want, you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. Don't forget to take a look at synapse.org.